everyone and welcome to Word Up. We of Word Up acknowledge that some of us are situated on the traditional land of the Anishinaabeg and Huron-Wendat people. Word Up is dedicated to honoring uh, Indigenous history and culture and are committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect with all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. We share in the heartbreak of all those impacted by the discovery of children in unmarked graves at residential schools, giving this acknowledgement deeper significance. Um, just to repeat what Colleen just said, I ask that you mute yourselves until we open up for questions um, and to hang in there for open mic where you got an opportunity to share your work. So tonight, our panel is Kickstart Your Writing with Writing Groups. Uh, three panelists join us tonight to help us discover how writing groups are, how writing groups help writers and where to find the right group for you. Each will have five minutes to introduce themselves and their organizations before we begin the panel questions. So tonight we are joined by actor, director, theater educator, and artistic director of Theater by the Bay, Ian Magosh, and lead editor of Speculative North Magazine, and organizer of 1900 plus member Toronto science fiction and fantasy writers, David Schultz, and romance and historical author American Marilyn Lamb of the Barry Writers Club, uh, who is also a member of Toronto Romance Writers. So um, who wants to start? Ian, do you want to start with your five minute introduction? Sure, why not? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Ian. Um, as uh, Linda said, I'm the artistic director of Theatre by the Bay. Um, for those who aren't familiar, Theatre by the Bay is a professional uh, theatre company uh, situated in Barrie that does original work that tells the stories of our community. So that has been a combination of historical pieces, uh, contemporary examinations, um, some fictional work as well, but all of it situated, like all of it that tells stories from, from the local area. Uh, at the same time, we, it's a policy of ours to try to hire locally as much as possible, thereby sort of supporting the local um, performing arts ecosystem and, uh, and, you know, promoting the amazing work that happens by Barry artists and Simcoe County artists more generally. Um, so I guess a little, and that's, so that's kind of what we do and everything that we've, that we do really stems from that mandate. So you'll be hearing me talk tonight about the Barry Theatre Lab, uh, which is one of the ways that we um, do outreach for the community and sort of help to break down barriers that people might have in their minds about the uh, writing theater and writing film and writing TV. Um, you know, and, and showing that it can be an accessible art form, an exciting art form, and, uh, and one that anyone from any age or background can engage in, which is really, really awesome. Uh, my job as artistic director of the company is uh, to choose all the programming that the company does. So uh, the shows that we do, which is usually uh, about two to three a year, plus some auxiliary programming and a couple education programs as well, uh, helping to run some of those programs and productions um, and kind of just having my, my fingers in all the pie, be it our marketing, be it the shows themselves, um, uh, as, as well as things like fundraising, administration, all that kind of stuff. So it's a really multifaceted job. It's um, certainly not one for the faint of heart, especially these days, but it's one that I uh, really enjoy. Um, in particular because of things like the Barry Theatre Lab, which really are such fantastic community hubs and that I've, I've loved to see grow and grow over the last um, few years. Uh, on top of that job, uh, I am, I, you know, I'm, I'm a theater kid at heart, which means I, I have to be creating theater, otherwise I go insane. Um, uh, sometimes I go insane because of trying to do all these things, but there we go. So uh, I'm a professional director. Um, I'm a, an actor as well. I went to George Brown Theater School for acting, um, but I'm also a theater. I'm in, so and tied in with that, I do a bit of producing as well, uh, some freelance theater instruction, just a little bit of everything. Um, but as an artist, I see myself as a as primarily a theater director. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of me and my job. Um, 
yeah, I think I don't, I don't need five minutes. I think that's, that's pretty well it. And if people have questions after that, they can talk to me after. That's great. Marilyn, you want to introduce yourself? Okay, um, I'm Marilyn Lamb, and I'm with the Berry Writers Club. Um, it was started in 1986 by Heather Kirk, who had moved to Berry. She was looking for like-minded um, writers to kind of have fellowship with, because writing can be a very solitary occupation. And sometimes you just need to be able to talk to other people who who understand the craft and, uh, you know, the angst you go through in the production of a, a short story, poem, novel, whatever it is that you happen to be working on. Um, the club has seen a lot of changes over the past 30 some years. Uh, I joined back in 1993, so I'm heading towards my 30 year anniversary. Um, but uh, it's a very eclectic group. We have all white writers from all different genres, um, everything from fantasy, science fiction, young adult, um, um, a new new adult. Um, what is it? I'm thinking of middle middle grade poets, um, people who are doing memoirs. And of course, uh, I'm doing a cross, well, I've got, I work on time travel romances and what I do are historicals and they're basically set in Canada and vampire novels crossed with Christianity, which is uh, not quite of the norm, but then that's me. <laughs> Now, as far as our group, like what our goals are, I'm going to read this directly because I haven't got it memorized. But um, the goal of the Barry Writers Club is to provide a supportive, uh, supportive environment that fosters encouragement and respect, allowing members the confidence to share their work, offer insights into the work of others, and enhance knowledge to improve their writing skills. A lot of what we focus on for now is critiquing, although we have held workshops, we do discuss any, say, contests or any place that we know, submissions, workshops, conferences, anything that anyone knows about, they'll share. Um, but we do focus on critiquing right now. Um, I really, that, that's really about it in a nutshell. Um, our group is uh, very, very supportive. Um, and I, you know, when the pandemic started, I couldn't see our group die because we couldn't meet in person. So I kind of took the reins and said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna meet online if we have to. And as I say, that's about it for uh, Barry Writers Club. Right now I'm, I'm serving as community contact so anyone who wants any more information about when we're meeting, um, how to, to get online with us, anything like that, they can always uh, contact me at my email address, which I think Linda will be putting in the, someone will be putting in the newsletter. <laughs> okay. David, do you wanna give us an introduction to, of yourself and uh, your organization? Yeah, um, definitely won't take five minutes. Um, but um, so as a writer, I write short fiction, science fiction and fantasy. Um, for my day job, I work as a teacher. Um, and uh, my organizing role, I guess, as for Toronto science fiction and fantasy is the um, probably the most important thing for, for now. But about that group um, started for similar reasons as uh, Marilyn's group was started, um, because there was um, a need for a community, uh, I sense. I mean, of course there are writers in, there are writing groups already in Toronto, but I searched around and I couldn't find one specifically for the genre that I was interested in. So a science fiction and fantasy focused writing group. Um, so we started that about, um, I think six, around six years ago now. Um, and it's grown uh, quite a lot since then. Um, in fact, actually as of the pandemic, um, since we opened it up to online, we didn't see a reason to restrict it to Toronto. So now we have our, our furthest West member is in Hawaii and our furthest East member is in France. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, we also have uh, a lot more meetings now, more than I could possibly 
host on my own. Um, I think we do uh, five per week now. Um, so all of those now are run by other people. Um, but the whole community is sort of, um, you know, at a certain point, if you have a small group of people meeting together, you're just some friends who are, you know, meeting together for a common purpose. As you grow, it sort of becomes a community and then it's held together by sort of expectations and values and, you know, shared understandings of the way things are supposed to operate and um, shared goals, helping each other, that sort of thing. So I think that's sort of um, how I would go about defining our community. I guess the uh, easiest way to do that would be to read, a, read a, our group mission, which I have here. So this is, um, here it goes. We are a positive, supportive, and encouraging group for speculative fiction writers. We meet to share our writing, to get reader feedback in a friendly, collegial, and constructive atmosphere, and to support each other in our development as writers. And uh, everything that we're doing in terms of the different types of meetings that we run is all sort of based on that, um, that shared mission. And I think that's probably good for an intro. If you have any more questions, please let me know. Oh, that's great. Those are all great intros. So I think Colleen's going to take it from here and uh, start with the first panel question. Absolutely. So I sent uh, we sent uh, the sort of the questions to our panelists beforehand so they could get an idea of what we were going to talk about. So. Um, I'm sure they've got some, a lot of great questions for them. So why don't we just get started? Um, so the first question we had for them was, what, what are the different kinds of groups? We said they've sort of touched on them a little bit um, in terms of and where does your group fit? So whether or not you're a critiquing group or whether or not you're, uh, uh, you know, like our group is more about sharing your work. Where do you fit? And, um, and sort of what are the different types of groups that there are? So I don't know if, uh, uh, Marilyn, you want to start? Sure. Um, I think our group right now is fitting in with the critiquing. Uh, we do have quite a few members who are working on, say, novels, and that basically what they're doing is kind of bringing a chapter or part of a chapter every week, and they'll read them, and we uh, comment on them, whether it's all online or we can kind of go through and make comments on the written pieces. But, um, but I think that's where we fall. Now, it's like we, again, are very generalized as far as um, genres go. We basically take everything. And um, so it, it, it's interesting then because you can be flipping from romance to horror to fantasy. So it's, it's kind of all over the place. Um, now, there are other groups, like if you are working in a particular genre, uh, there are other groups, maybe not so much right in Barrie or in the close area, but I think right now with so much online, as uh, David was saying, you can kind of go anywhere in the world to find a group that fits with what you're doing. I belong to the Toronto Romance Writers, and I find a lot of the workshops that they do don't necessarily apply to strictly romance. You could apply them to every area of writing. So I find that's really good for me too, because it helps me um, kind of support my own skills. And I can sometimes come up with some real aha moments with uh, when they're doing their workshops. But, uh, but I guess that, that's really about it. As I say, our group is more of a critiquing group, but we provide as much encouragement as we can. Um. Thank you. Yeah, I would um, I would definitely agree with you about the Toronto Romance Writers. I write uh, science fiction, but um, I've been to a bunch of many of their conferences and romance writers really know the business of writer writing, I find. They uh, have great, great courses and great sort of knowledge of, of, of how to how to how to make it work. Um, David, did you have any? Do you want to add something? Yeah, um, we originally started the group with critiquing in mind, um, thinking about the fact that um, getting somebody else's eyes on your work is a necessary part of the process because you can only go so far on your own imagining how other people will take your work. Um, so you have to do it at some point. So that's why we started it um, and it was useful in that regard. But um, as the group grew um, and people expressed other interests, we started adding other things. Like once a week we do uh, writing sprints where we just get together and we will just write as fast as we can for 25 minutes, take a few minutes 
you know, for casual chat and just to take a little bit of a break and then go back to it and just repeat that for three hours. And um, when we originally envisioned it, we thought of doing um, samples, 2000 word, 2000 word selections, um, which is a reasonable chunk and you can get through five or six of those in a three hour meeting. Um, but you lose some of the bigger picture elements. Um, so um, in order to get that big picture view, we implemented um, novel exchanges where one meeting would be devoted to um, an, a novel in its entirety for one of the one of the members. And then there's an expectation that that member would then read other people's novels in subsequent meetings. So we've added more of those as we went along. So I guess um, the, the, the one unifying thing really for our group is the genre. But um, outside of that, we're trying to offer lots of different types of things, including occasional workshops, like on particular craft elements or something like that. Yeah, it's interesting that, uh, my apologies, I have my furnace on, so you'll hear some noise in the background, but um, I find it interesting that as you grew, you found you needed to sort of diversify and you started meeting the different needs of the group, obviously from what your members needed, right? Yeah, and also that there's sufficient demand to justify it at a certain size. So maybe some percentage of our members had always wanted to do, you know, craft workshops, but they we had to reach a certain point before before it sort of made sense. Right. Um, Ian, did you want to jump in? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think what makes the the Barry Theater Lab kind of distinct from other writing groups is the fact that it is uh, specialized around theater, and so theater is at the end of the day, an auditory and visual media, artistic medium, right? We, we hear, we absorb the story by hearing it as well as by uh, seeing it, right? So in the case of the Barry Theater Lab, we're a critiquing group in so far as, you know, we give feedback after we have read it as a group, but it's actually more, at, more likely than not, at least from my perspective, it's the hearing of it that actually does a lot of the work for the playwright. Um, they get they as you know if something is 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 read in a certain way or you know and certainly as well actors are are creative beings and even if it's a cold read they'll infuse themselves into the character into the work and take it in unexpected directions. So that ends up actually doing a lot of the um, the work of the the critiquing. Um, and that's, I think, another important part of it is the fact that the Barry Theatre Lab isn't just a writing group. It's also a chance for actors to practice their cold reading skills. Um, it's a place for theater lovers just to kind of come in and share the, and share their perspectives on what they're hearing. You know, people don't have to participate if they don't want to while they're there. It's it's very flexible. So it's kind of turned while it started as uh, as a critiquing group, kind of like the other um, panelists here this evening. It started as a uh, with a goal of critiquing, but it's ended up turning into this community hub that is very self sustaining. That is broken down a lot of barriers amongst kind of disparate groups across the region. Um, and it's provided a common hub where people can get together and share their works in progress, be they, uh, you know, very established playwrights that have had a couple things produced already to 14 year olds who are writing a script for the Sears Festival and heard about this thing and wanted to, to her get it get some feedback on it before they submit and that i think is what makes it uh really special and really uh really unique as well yeah absolutely i, I can see how you have sort of all a, it must be very dynamic meetings i mean even, probably more so when you're in person because you have, have all these different elements that are sort of working together at the same time certainly yeah it's, it's a bit of networking as well it's yeah, yeah. there's we yeah. bring coffee it's great <laughs> Um, wonderful. So thank you. So let's so move away a little bit from the groups now and sort of talk about the individuals who might be interested in actually joining these groups. So what what do you gain from being part of a writing group or a circle or a critiquing group? What um, what can that bring for you? Do you want to start with that, David? Sure. Um, yeah, uh, I guess the first thing I would say is that um, nobody really succeeds alone. Um, you need to have other people there. Um, it, it is a community thing. Um, and like Marilyn was mention, mentioning, writing it can be very solitary. So I guess 
I think the the biggest thing, of course, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things like technical things that you'll pick up, but as long as you stick to it, you're going to pick those things up as you go. Um, but sticking to it um, is probably the most important thing. So the thing you're getting out of a group is a community of people who are going to help you do that, who ideally is are going to be positive and encouraging, um, and, and and provide you the support that you need as an artist. Yeah, absolutely. You can't. You, you, it's it's almost impossible to do it all on your own, as you were saying. I, I totally agree with that. Um, um, Marilyn, did you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I kind of go along with with David's thinking. Our um, our group. Uh, I think what people gain is the sense of they'll hear their work being read aloud, and maybe they'll find the places where they're kind of falling short or just from the critiquing, whether it's for technical, whether it's adding emotion to the work, um, giving us more description or possibly less description. It's the skill set that everybody brings and everyone has a different perspective, but we can all agree on work that's well done. We have seen people come to our, our meetings that started out with very basic bare bones work and watch them improve over time so that they read a chapter and you're going wow that's wonderful hmm. so you know but there's always something you can say but <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah but we want to support as much as possible as we say anything we say that they see as a negative or could see as a negative is said only to support and improve the work not to bring them down they can either take it or leave it at their own discretion. Right. Yes. I, I'm, it's interesting when you talk about seeing the, the members improve over time, it must be sort of a, such a great um, sort of not bonding experience, but must really bring people together to be able to see each other improving over time. Um, Ian. I mean, yeah, I would say essentially the same things really. Yeah. Um, uh, I, th I think certainly something that can't be understated is um, the fact that th the feeling when you when you when someone perhaps is vocalizing about their play or their piece of writing uh, is something that you were feeling as well, but might be ashamed to admit like, oh, you know, I don't know, I've, I've been I, I pumped this out or, you know, like, oh, I've been really ra wrangling with this, like it gives you permission to open up. And to and to be more willing and able to absorb criticism for perhaps by watching other people go through that and be so transparent, you know, at the end of the day, we all want to be successful, we want to create art that is meaningful, we all want you know, we all want our next thing to be the best thing that we've done. Uh, and, you know, and, and, but part of that is not only the practice of the skill, it's also just learning what it means to be a better artist. And I think, yeah, finding a tribe and finding ways in yourself to, you know, sift through notes and, and, be open and transparent about your process, I think is uh, are really, really uh, invaluable skills. Um, certainly as well, again, because the Barry Theater Lab is a little different, I think networking is also a big uh, asset to, uh, to the, our group in particular, um, because there's lots of different people in the room, not just writers, right? An actor, a producer, a director might say, wow, that play was really, really good you know, I want to direct it or like, you know, let's talk about this, that kind of thing. And, um, and that synergy we've seen time and time again. Um, and as well, yes, like, you know, all, all the other wonderful things that the panelists spoke to as well. Right. You bring up some really amazing points. And I love your point about the transparency and, and also about how, learning how to be an artist. I mean, when you start first started as an artist, it's you're so it's so all feedback is so personal. And just being able to learn that, to be able to step away from your work and sort of look at the work and not as feel it like it's an attack on yourself. Huge, huge thing for writers to learn, I think. Yeah. Um, so moving on to our, our other questions, um, how do how does how do writers or artists, for that matter, find a group that fits for them? What's the best way to go about that? Um, Ian, you might as well start with that one. Uh 
sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, uh, we live in an age of social media. Social media is definitely a good place to get started. Um, asking around as well, like to, to people within your, your network is always good. Um, uh, you might also try different locations, like, like for instance, contacting the library or seeing what's up on their, their calendar. Um, yeah, just places like yeah, look for places that where you think things might happen, and they probably are. But all, uh, but also, uh, yeah, of course, social media, the internet, and your net, your network are probably good places. To see. Wonderful, and I, I forgot to say at the start, but you know, if Marilyn or David if, or Ian, if you want to jump in at any time and sort of you know talk about one of the other something the other panelists said, feel free. We try to keep this fairly informal. It doesn't have to be structured though the whole time. Um, but Marilyn, if you want to go next. Well, I find Google is wonderful. <laughs> you know, writing groups in particular area or genre. Um, just it, it lets you kind of travel the world to find what you're looking for. But, you know, a lot of what Ian has said is true. You know, your libraries, whatever programs they have going, sometimes you can find out about different groups there, uh, networking with others. Um, Facebook pages, like the Toronto Romance Writers, they have their own uh, Facebook page. Um, you know, it's a, social media has become the... Uh, the thing it's it's just that's the road to uh you know finding where you belong well and how and how specifically like would, would you suggest people try different ones out or you know i just how do you know when it's the right fit i guess is my question well i think what you need to do is is find one that say that you're interested in say you're a mystery writer and you come across sisters in crime and you want to find it oh okay what that looks like something i might like to do there's probably contact information you can ask them questions they probably have a person that you can co communicate with and you can ask them questions ask them what their formats are um, what they're doing as far as do they do workshops um, you know, that kind of thing, so that you get a feel for what the group is before you actually jump in and say, oh, okay, I'm going to join. And sometimes you just have to go and try it out too. That's, you know, we get quite a few people coming in just to, because they heard about the Writers Club, they want to see what it's all about, whether it's, you know, we say, you know, you can check it out a couple of times, see if it's the right fit for you. You know, if it is, great. And if it isn't, you know, that's entirely up to you. Right. I mean, another benefit of social media as well is the fact that you can, if someone, if it is a, a Facebook page, like Marilyn mentioned, or a Facebook group, you can see which friends are part, like, like that page or follow that group. So you, so if you're really hesitant or, or whatever, you can reach out to that person, perhaps, if you feel comfortable doing that and being like, hey, I'm thinking of trying out this thing, you know, anything I should know, or, or how was that, or you know that sort of thing and th that you know they'll they'll likely give you their opinion okay. yeah very good point Dad, do you want to add anything to that david uh, um so once you've found a group that looks promising and you find yourself you know at your first meeting um i guess things to look out for at that point are um like i think a good meeting is anyone where you leave wanting to write more um so if you're not feeling encouraged in that way, if, if somebody's discouraging you, that might not be a good group because in terms of your long-term success, um, it's, it's going to be very important to keep that motivation up. Um, your, your writing skill is completely unrelated to your, to your motivation. It's, very, it's quite possible to discourage a very talented person from writing just by being mean to them or something like that. Um, so it's very important um, that you find a community that has those emotional supports. If a group is not making you feel respected or not making you feel that your voice is valued, I think that's probably a warning sign. I would suggest looking for a group that makes you feel positive um, when you're there. Um, I also personally, I don't like the idea that um, somebody would hold experience or accomplishments over somebody else. Um, I think we're all 
you know, all of us as creators are walking the same path and we're, you know, we're taking that journey differently, but um, we all deserve equal respect. Um, and um, I think you should, I think that's another thing that you should probably look for in a group. I, in some communities, um, there's a, I don't know, uh, some, some norms that I, that I don't really agree with. Um, like, for example, the idea that beginning writers need to go through a trial by fire where people are very mean to them. Um, I, I don't like that uh, perspective myself. I think, um, I think the role of a mentor should be supporting people. Um, and that means first, um, you know, emotionally, not, not just in terms of being a harsh critic. Um, and other ideas like, um, like uh, somebody with more experience can get away with being, being mean to students because they earned the right to do that or something, which, is, which I've seen a lot of stories like that in terms of um, famous writers be, being uh, given control over a classroom, for example, a creative writing classroom. And then you hear these, these horror stories about uh, all the terrible experiences that the students have had. Um, there's no reason to put yourself through that as a writer. Um, if you're in that community, um, vote with your feet by leaving and, and find, find a community that, um, that is properly supportive and encouraging. That's a very good point, actually. I think it's very easy for writers and artists to get derailed with that kind of criticism. We've all had it and know how damaging, can, how damaging it can be. Um, so that is a very good segue, actually, into our next question in terms of, uh, is it important to have firm rules around critiquing? Um, I don't know if anybody who wants to jump in, do you want to start, Marilyn, since you critique? Yeah, well, we do, um, we do have rules about critiquing. Basically, we, we ask that when a person is first coming out to a meeting, like their first meeting, that they not verbally critique the work to just get a feel for what we do as a group. Mm -hmm. And, but if they have a printed copy or a copy on the computer that they can look at and make notes on, they're free to do that. But we like them to kind of get a feel for how how we handle things um, when we give critiques, because it, you're right, it has to be a supportive atmosphere, whether you're telling someone that they need to improve in some area, it still has to be done in such a way that you're showing them support, encouragement and uh, respect. Uh, so, you, you know, you know, you can't just sit there and be mean and I don't think anyone would want that. Um, I know we've had uh, probably have had people um, not come back because their first experience we've given what we call a, a hard critique. We have three levels. We have the light critique where basically we say you say you can say one thing that needs to improve but the rest has to be positive. Um, the, the second critique is, okay, you can say, if you see a couple of things that need a bit of work, okay, but still be positive. And then we have what we call the hard critique, which I always laugh. I say, okay, that's when we bring out the cat and nine tails. <laughs> but it's, you know, and some of them come in and say, well, I want a hard critique. I want you to tell me what's, what's missing in my work. So again, but it's, it's better to be gentle to start with and then new people coming out will see that you're not going to pounce on them. Mm -hmm. I love right. that idea of having the, the three different levels and then people can, you know, they can choose what level they're prepared for, right? And know, know what's coming. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Ian, how about your group? Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, we, we do as well. Um, there, we try to build it in to the nature of each reading, if that makes sense, instead of kind of being like, okay, everyone, you know, let's sit down and recite the the the, the five rules of the lab or whatever. Um, it, instead, it's it's very much like, why don't you? So at the beginning of every reading, we ask the playwright if they want to preface the work before we read it, right? So that gives that gives uh, the the listeners a chance to sort of gauge where the playwright is at in terms of what in terms of the script's development and what exactly they're looking for us to help them with as we read and that i think really helps then frame the conversation afterwards um which is which again which is also uh 
launched by the playwright themselves. So, so that, so we, so we usually start with like, wow, that was amazing. Great job. Round of applause. Now, do you have any questions for the group? And then the playwright, it can be something like, oh, uh, what do you think? Or it could be something more specific, like, you know, like in my last, since my last draft, I've been working on infusing this character. Do we find that 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 character is working? And then that's sort of the launching point for future convert for the rest of the discussion. That doesn't mean that we have to fall strictly within those the, like within those questions, but it kind of gives the playwright to be to like, I guess, subconsciously almost give us permission or give us the level of criticism that they're looking for that we as emotionally, you know, sensitive people can kind of be like, okay, this is what they, they need. Um, you know, we're not there to badger them. We're not there to, you know, destroy them. But then also I certainly feel that I, whether it's myself or Leah Holder, the other person who runs the lab, we, it's our responsibility to ensure that the conversate that the criticism stays appropriate and that and that the con like all the entire conversation is guided um and that i certain like it seems at least to be a methodology that works pretty well for us uh and then also we we also give the option um leah holder who who uh who's our education and creation coordinator and her job now uh part of which is to run the lab um uh she always gives the chance for playwrights to get more additional feedback from her specifically because she is a dramaturg. Um, uh, she does a lot of dramaturgy. She has a lot of experience with new work. So, so it kind of gives a second chance then for the playwright to get that additional criticism if they're looking for it and they reach out to her for it as well. Did sort of have a follow up question for you. So, how much in in terms of your critiquing process do would people actually sort of have ideas about where the work could go? Do you sort of shy away from that, or you know what I mean? Like in terms of oh, you could do this, or why don't you? Do you do any of that? Uh, yeah, we. I mean, certainly we we have. Um, I mean, there's also been like we also in terms of like where the script is at, we have no rules. We've okay. done script outlines to full three and a half hour long plays like we've done everything um so uh so it really just kind of depends mm -hmm. um and sometimes yeah like a, i remember a couple times a playwright brought in the first half and said so what do you think should happen <laughs> and then and then used us as a sounding board for for the hit for this playwright to then get ideas about what could happen and then it sort of turned into like oh yeah and then this could happen and this could happen and like that sort of that sort of thing so again it's kind of what the playwright is looking for mm -hmm. um obviously people do have ideas and suggestions that they throw out there and i think it speaks to the the quality of the lab that uh that people feel comfortable mm -hmm. expressing those those kinds of ideas um but if we sense that the playwright is not looking for that then we are usually pretty good at kind of steering the conversation back on course okay yeah so very much a very flexible sort of dynamic situation obviously um david do you want to uh, chime in yeah uh, well on that particular point <clears throat> one thing that i've heard is um if a reader tells you that something is not working for them they're almost always right and if they tell you how to fix it they're almost always wrong um, um that goes to the rules, um, which I do think are very important. Um, but uh, one of our rules is that we're responding as readers, not as editors. Um, and that's important because um, we're focused on putting everyone on an equal um, playing field here. Like we're all um, coming from the same place. No one is recognized as a professional editor or anything like that. So we're all responding as readers. And we're all qualified to say whether a piece worked for us or not. But we're not all qualified to say on a level of craft, um, technical execution, what would be the best way to address this particular problem. So that's just an example of one of the rules that we use. Um, for the most part, I guess if you had a, a um, experienced and um, uh, compassionate and, and overall good uh, moderator, you could probably run a meeting without having a clear set of rules. 
Um, but the rules even in that case would help. But especially as your group um, becomes a community, you're gonna need those rules to, um, to maintain the sort of atmosphere, which will gradually change over time as the, as the group composition changes or from week to week if there's different participants there. Um, there's little ways that it could potentially slip that people will not necessarily know why something is a rule. Like for example, the rule that we have that um, it's very important for the person not to defend their work while they're receiving criticism. Uh, it's, a, it's a natural reaction. Um, and I think we all have it. Um, and if it wasn't trained out, out of us in writing groups, we would be naturally inclined to say, oh, I've thought about this, trust me, in two pages, you're gonna see the answer or something like that. And, and uh, it's, not it's not immediately obvious to people why that sort of thing is not productive to do in a meeting, um, for example. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. That's always very hard to do your first critique, critique group is sit there and not say anything when they're talking about your work, very challenging. And I'm curious in terms of your group, like, did you find it, did you have to sort of make a more concerted effort to maintain that sort of mentality and that kind of um, uh, space as the group grew? Um, it, yeah, a little bit. Um, but generally speaking, it's a very um, it's a very positive and encouraging and supportive community. And they sort of um, everyone gets a sense of the room, you know, when they join and they and they sort of um, pick up the norms. But gradually, you notice every now and then when things might slip in little ways. In which case, it might just take a little reminder at the start of a meeting or something like that. Um, in terms of the you know, little things like that, it really doesn't bother me too much, unless it's like really derailing the discussion, you know, and, and it's going on for five minutes or something, and then everyone's there, their time is not being, not being used efficiently. In that case, I might step in, but otherwise it doesn't really matter too much, unless it is a rule that is there for the purpose of, um, um, I guess, uh, protecting the integrity of people. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, it is possible to make a critique that would be implicitly an attack on someone's identity. Um, what I mean by that, this happens sometime, not in our group, um, we're good about this. It has happened maybe once in the few years that we've been there, um, but um, it's something that I would always want to stamp out immediately and make sure that it's clear in the rules that you should not ask a question like, why is this character gay? Um, because the implicit assumption there is that, well, everyone's straight, right? Unless there's a reason for it. Um, so it's a heteronormative implication there um, by asking that question in a critique. The answer is some people are gay, some characters are gay, you know, get over it. This, my, this character is gay. Um, don't make that the content of your critique. So, so something like that, I think, is a very important rule as well. And the sort of thing that needs to be immediately jumped on if, if something of that nature um, comes up. Yeah, absolutely. I find it fascinating when you're talking about your group to see, you can almost see the progression of how your group has evolved as these issues have come up. And obviously you've, you know, made a conscious effort to address them as they come up so that it's a supportive open environment for everybody, right? Yeah, I think it's, that's very important. That's not the number one thing for me. I mean, I think it should be that um, supporting people emotionally, um, respectfully, you know, as a, as a community of equals, I, I think is number one. Um, the, the craft stuff, that will come on its own, as long as people stick to, to the craft over time. Yeah, fascinating, yeah. Um, so we're gonna move on to a sort of a uh, little bit step away, but in terms of, it's not that we really wanna talk about the pandemic, we sort of try to avoid that, but um, has, has the pandemic affected your groups and its members and um, has your group sort of become more relevant or have you lost members during the pandemic? What, how has that sort of affected uh, affected your organization? And David, you might as well start. Yeah, well, um, it grew quite a lot. Um, yeah, uh, we took members from all over the place. And it actually turned out to be quite nice because one of our longtime members had to move, but they could continue to come to the meetings because we're online now. So even when the pandemic's over, we're going to maintain the online presence for the benefit, at least of those people and for the people who just don't want to do the commute. So it's actually overall, I think it's been a net positive for us, even though it is nice to see people in person and it's a different sort of uh, different sort of atmosphere. And there are challenges with online in particular with uh, body language, um, knowing when to talk, knowing how to um, get that dimension of communication. It's very tricky over Zoom. Yeah. So that would be the biggest problem. But um, I, I am glad that we were able to, to continue the group and to grow it uh, online. 
and will you meet in person afterwards as well sort of do the, yeah. the hybrid yeah when it's safe to do we'll re we'll return in person for sure and we'll we'll keep the online meetings as well yeah. absolutely yeah um and what about you ian um yeah uh certainly it has changed i mean uh the, like the 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 makeup the dynamics the way it all works it certainly changed the group a bit uh, i would say we're a little bit smaller only because i think a lot of people like it's just not the same like being in the room hearing the scripts out loud you know that networking a lot of the things that made the berry theater lab or that makes the berry theater lab so great were 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 lacking and also i also find that like reading scripts over Zoom is much more exhausting than it is in person. Like I, I mentioned, we've read three and a half hour long scripts before. In a room, that's fine. On Zoom, that's impossible. Like I, I, I can't. I just can't do it. So, so that has certainly changed um, that a bit. But uh, yeah, same sort of thing um, that uh, that David said. It, like it's changed the the dynamics of the group insofar as now we have a much broader net of people to draw from so in it like i actually i would say if anything the berry group has gotten a little smaller but the ontario group popping in has gotten a lot bigger um so we've had writers from toronto we've had writers from halliburton we've had writers from all over the place that have heard about the berry theater lab um in some cases are we're looking to at kingston started one as a direct result of having been in the lab and seeing what a great um thing it is uh other you know people have been able to pop in and 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 do that um and yeah i would i would agree i think if if people like i don't know i think probably as the pandemic hopefully wanes for good um uh we'll probably keep it as an option and see if it it is a service that is used a lot um uh, and and we'll we'll go go from there but i don't know yeah just being in the room with people it's what theater is really all about and it's just not the same with that yeah i can see that and we've um at word up we've done some hybrid events which have their own challenges doing both the online and the in person at the same time so it's yeah it's it's forever changing so uh marilyn what about you guys well, in a sense, I think our our group has grown somewhat smaller. Mind you, in person, we could have anywhere from six to 17 or 18 people come out in person. Right now, it's kind of averaging between, say, five to 10. But the people that are coming out now are very dedicated to um, forwarding their own work, and helping anyone that needs critiquing to forward their work. So I'm finding from that standpoint, it's almost like we've become more supportive of each other. Maybe it's because of the fact we can't see each other kind of house. Um, but uh, what I think is, is strong right now. We may, it, when the pandemic ends, we may keep it as a hybrid because one of our members who has been quite active with us moved to Sudbury, but now she can join us on the Monday nights uh, as a rule because we're online. So if we can, we might look at keeping it hybrid. I know Toronto Romance writers, they've talked about keeping their meetings hybrid, which I'm going yay about because I can't get to the meetings. I don't drive, I don't have transportation. so online I can get to a, get to a meeting <laughs> but uh, but yeah it, it does tend to change the dynamic because it is nicer to meet in person um, you know to have that actual physical presence but um, I'm, I'm still finding that we're getting you know fairly strong um, support from the members that are coming out and they're ones that really are after getting the work critiqued and strengthening their skills. I'd love to hear from the other panelists on this. Uh, have you felt that it has brought in a lot of new people? Because like uh, certainly with the Berry Theater Lab, I think like one of the things that is sort of um, 
delighted me is the fact that a lot of people that have never considered writing a play before are suddenly trying it because they're locked in their house and they're, they're an actor and they can't act. So what's the way they can get it out? Well, by writing on a page. And I was curious if you have felt that amongst your communities as well. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, we've had quite a few new people show up over the summer and the fall they've been uh, contacting me and they'll come out to meetings we've had some that have been really great about sticking around and others are just kind of come to a few and like they haven't said oh this isn't for me they're just not showing up but I still send them the emails to remind them and if they show they show if they don't well we're down just to a little smaller group a little more time for each other then Yeah, I've def definitely noticed a lot of new members, but I wouldn't be able to tell you relative mm, relative uh, experience with writing. Um, but I can see how um, an easier barrier to entry, you know, you can just drop in on a drop in on a Zoom meeting, might um, I guess lower the bar for for people who are not as confident in their in their experience. But I, I haven't actually noticed, you know, relative to pre pandemic, it, the proportion of already experienced to, to complete beginners. Yeah, fair enough. Just curious. Colleen, for Word Up, would you say um, we've, I think we've had a few different um, returning people show up for Word Up. Um, and we might have lost a few of the ones we had who used to come to, to see us at uh, Unity Market. Yeah, I would agree that we, uh... It's, it's almost like a, we've sort of shifted. We sort of had a different crowd before who was very much interested in the open mic, a lot of more spoken word and that type of thing. Whereas now that we're online, we seem to be maybe different, a different group, obviously depending on what our topic is. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, we, again, same, we have people coming from farther away. We've met, been able to get authors who live farther away. You know, there's some, some good as well. Yeah, yeah, and that part I like, but we've also, I found that when we first started doing just the readings, um, I think we started losing people because people don't want to be read to, I think, on a Zoom, you know, or online. There was something about uh, being read some poetry or, or, or having some performance art in a cafe that wasn't transferring well or as well here, which is why we went to the panels, which is more informative. And, and we definitely have more writers or all writers showing up where before it was writers and some people who just enjoyed you know, the listening and watching. So we've had some changes too, for sure. We've just kind of gone with the punches. Yeah. Well, and I think also in some ways it's more intimidating reading on Zoom as well, because you're just lacking that feedback. You don't, you can't read the room. It's very much more difficult. Um, it's true. You can't read the room, but the other opposite side of that is you can, like we post our videos, so you can actually watch your own performance and see what habits you didn't know you had. Like, I didn't know. I was going, well, I do that all the time now. <laughs> so you can also um, improve your performance because it's on Zoom too, so. Yes, very true. Lots of good and bad with all of this, this, with this situation. Um, so we have two more questions before we go to the questions from the audience. Um, and I guess it's, so what is you, what would you consider some of your group's best successes? And then what are your, what are your biggest struggles? I mean, we've obviously touched on some of them, um, but uh, if you had anything you wanted to add to that, maybe um, David, if you want to go first. Yeah, um, well, I recently sent out an email to the members to let them know about some of our successes last year. So this is question is easier to answer, I guess. Um, but one thing that um, 50 of our members had uh, had paid publications uh, last year. Um, there were a few novels published, um, a few grants awarded. Um, but I made careful to um, mention in the email, and the, the more important thing that I wanted to mention now is that um, success is defined very differently for very different people. And I don't think we should um, pick one thing as the mark of success. I think the most important success, the thing that I'm most proud of and most happy to be a part of is, is the, the fact that we have a community of people who's um, helping each other um, 
you know, put their ideas on paper and, you know, make their visions into art. Um, I think that is the, that I would say is the biggest success for sure that we have that community built up that's that's engaged in that all the time in a positive and encouraging way. Well, and I love the fact that how you you very specifically talk about defining success because that is very different for everybody and it doesn't necessarily mean publication. I mean, for somebody just getting up and certainly in our group, reading their work can be a huge success for them. So I, I totally understand that. Um, David, or sorry, Ian. Uh, yeah, I mean, hard to disagree with that answer. <laughs> um, but I, I guess, like from from our perspective, uh, we've we've hit a couple milestones that I thought that have certainly been exciting. So just this month, uh, the lab had its fifth anniversary, which is a pretty big deal uh, for for uh, the entire community. Um, and during that time, we've now workshopped over 130 plays, individual plays. So that doesn't, and that doesn't necessarily mean like, like that, I should, rather I should say those 130 plays include like people that wrote a draft and then came back and worked it again with us. Like we consider that one. <laughs> so that just speaks to uh, the, the, the breadth of um, work that has emerged like I guess hopefully as part of the fact that the community has this place where they feel so safe, so comfortable, um, and so compelled to uh, to create work for it. So uh, that's that's something. Uh, and then also I just I also love like one of my favorite things is to hear about shows that were workshopped at the lab that are getting produce like that is just so so cool uh and we've had um, quite a few cases of that now um uh there was actually a show that we workshopped uh that was supposed to be done um off broadway as part of a, a series by young autistic playwrights from from north america that and that was just such a cool feeling was just that in some small way we helped contribute to that was really really special so uh yeah, I, I that those are kind of if I had to give some markers, those would be ones that I would uh, that I'm I'm happy. Yeah, and I, and I think that sort of speaks again to the community and sort of that sense of su the support and how and helping people be successful in whatever shape that takes. Um, Marilyn, well, I think our group's greatest success was when we uh, published we published two anthologies of short stories and poetry, all put together by our members. And I know so many people were so excited that feeling of actually getting a book in your hand with your work in it. It was, uh, you know, pretty uh, exhilarating. Um, so like we used to do writing prompts for people we take okay we'll take 10 minutes and you just write to, we'd throw an idea out to whether it was a picture or opening sentence or something like that and just have people write for 10 minutes like it was one of those don't think about it just write and a lot of the stories that came into the two anthologies came out of those uh, those particular prompts um I think our biggest struggle for a while, we did go through a period, I'd say back in the mid to late 90s, when we were having issues with members coming out, we had gone down, we were actually just meeting once a month because people just were not coming out. And I'm not sure what happened. I'm not sure what changed in the dynamic. But all of a sudden we were going and people were saying, oh yeah, we'd like to meet a couple of times a month. So we were meeting every two weeks. And then we had enough people coming out that were saying well we'd like to meet every every week that you know that gives us the incentive to keep on writing if we have to bring something next week so it, the struggle kind of turned into a success just uh, through the phase of evolution let's call it and i think barry growing the way it did and more people coming coming into the community probably made a big difference well, and I think that speaks, you know, certainly to the organizers of these kind of things as well, that, you know, when you're talking about how you sort of, you know, went down to a few members and then you ended up growing in then that sort of the hardest thing is, or the most important thing maybe is just to keep going and just to keep, you know, providing that community, providing that support and, you know, people will come and go, but as long as you can maintain, maintain that consistency. Right. 
Um, I, does, has everybody answered that question? I think you guys have, right? Well, you asked about <laughs> struggles as well. Right, um, right. Yeah. So in terms of our struggles, uh, honestly, I like it, you know, this, this might be kind of funny to say, but I, I think one of our biggest struggles is just the fact that we wish we could do more to help people once they've written their script, right? Like we, like there's only a certain uh, amount of workshopping and stuff that we can do and it's, and there's not really the infrastructure in, at least in Simcoe County for work to be seen in lots of places, right? Um, so, and we're hoping to we're actually attempting to address that this year we're uh we're hoping to launch um a, a theater festival and the hope is that you know scripts can those scripts that though by perhaps playwrights that have never been produced other places can get that that chance can get that experience of having their work presented and seen at the next level um and uh, and and honestly, that's that's been one of the biggest ones for us. Is just like we want to help, but we're we're only so big. So still, I mean, kudos for you to try and address that problem. I mean, that's uh, that's I I will come to your festival if if it happens. <laughs> I will Simcoe say. County Theater Festival in June. I'll put it in the chat. Awesome, that would be great. Um, David or Marilyn? Uh, David, maybe you can go next. Oh no, I guess Marilyn, you already talked about struggles. Did you yes, have already, any, yep. <laughs> any struggles, David, or have you sort of already talked about that? Not really. Um, I mean, I guess the major thing that I needed to learn was, um, I guess, delegating things as things grew. And that was actually not really a struggle. It was actually very, very easy because uh, the people taking on those other hosting roles were, are, are all really good. So, um, so that made that, that learning part of it very easy for me. Um, but yeah, I think, I feel like the group is running very smoothly and there, and there haven't been too many, um, problems. Nothing really jumps out at me really. Um, I mean, I guess the initial transition to online had a little bit of wrangling involved and, you know, there's sometimes tech issues and we're not using Zoom for our meetings. Um, we're using a software called Discord, which is um, more complicated than Zoom and it, off and it can lead to tech issues sometimes. There's a more of a learning curve, but we chose it because um, it's better for handling text. Um, so we, while while someone is reading, we will be looking at the text and marking it up um, uh, while they're reading it. Um, so that's the way we, we manage it. It works quite well, but um, it does create you know tech potential tech problems that crop up every now and then. Uh, fascinating. I've heard of other groups using Discord actually for that reason, the audio and and uh, the yeah the built-in capabilities of it. Yeah, I've heard a lot of mm -hmm. stuff about Discord. Yeah, in terms of the trade-off, I mean, the video on Dis on Discord is not good, but um, when we're listening to a piece, we're not really looking at the person reading. We're looking at the, I mean, if we're in person, we'd be looking at the at the copy that they've given us. Um, so we're sort of trying to do our best to, to simulate that by having the digital copy in front of us. Okay, well, that brings us to our final question, our final, final official question for the panelists, um, and it's maybe our most personal one, um, but how has your involvement in the group influenced your own career or writing or artistic pursuits, whatever it is that you, uh, you do? Um, Marilyn, would you like to start? Well, I think just having the support and the feedback has been really, helping me out. Um, I was taking one work to the group and they were giving me feedback on it. And then I was taking it to my secondary critique group and was getting feedback. And I finally, I self-published that book a couple of years ago. Um, but uh, so that to me was a success because uh, it finally saw something come to fruition. But uh, Personally, I find the group that we have now is very supportive, very encouraging, and, uh, you know, they kind of uh, allow me the, the latitude to guide them through whatever they're doing, too, and it's, it's a responsibility, but I, but I love doing it. I love, I love being able to meet with other writers and 
it does motivate me. Um, if I find if I don't have a writer's meeting for a while, I really start to feel laggy. <laughs> you know, my writing just kind of wants to sit. But having that uh, kind of um, being accountable keeps, keeps me going. Not so much of late, but I because I personally I've been working on about three different po projects on revisions for them all, and I've kind of had to put new writing to the sidelines. So, but uh, it it just helps to have that support behind me. Great, thank you. And I know um, David that it's a bit different for you because this sort of is your job in a way. But did you want to go ahead? Yeah, I mean, I certainly I've spent enough time on it for it to be considered a job, although I don't make any money from it. Right. Um, yeah, um, including the publishing that we also do. Um, is, we don't make any money from that either. Um, our funding model is basically we do a, we do a crowdfunding. We make sure that we have enough money to make the thing exist, um, which means mostly paying authors. That's the big, big, biggest expense. But then there's also cover and stuff like that. And then once we have that, then we just give it away. Uh, so it is possible to buy it uh, as a paperback, in which case there's, you know, um, there's the uh, shipping and printing costs. But um, other than that, we we also, I mean, we give it away for free on the website as any book form. Um, so, that, so the idea there is just to get it to as many people as possible while also making sure the, the authors get money. Um, but nobody else who's working on these is getting money like um, myself or any of the other editors who we have. Um, and it's a big team. It's like 20 to 30 people at any given time for the magazine um, who are doing different kinds of work. And most of those are frontline readers on the slush pile or the submissions queue. Um, but um, yeah, it wouldn't be possible without all of that volunteer work. And none of the people are making any money from it, except for the authors who eventually get accepted. Um, but in terms of how it's affected me, I mean, I suppose I've had to pick up a lot of new skills um, as I go along, um, like how to put these things together and put them out there. Um, but um, we've been doing a lot of these different types of anthology projects. We do one, one a year, we do a, what's called a one-shot anthology, where we get a theme, we sit down. Um, in, I mean, in uh, before the pandemic, we did this at a bar. Um, now we do it online, but we just sit down and we spend the day just writing a story, start to finish. We have 24 hours, firm deadline, and then we put them all together. Um, so that's one of the fun projects that we do. Um, the other anthologies we do are actually with open calls. Um, so we put out one of those uh, uh, less than a month ago for Christmas, uh, with which was all Christmas horror stories. Um, we've got another one coming out in a, in a month that's all, all uh, science fiction and fantasy war stories and then we have a collection of stories about religion and science fiction and fantasy but um that doing all of that stuff juggling all of those projects um at the at the mm, at the role that i'm doing it at is a lot of logistical and management skills um um I wouldn't want to suggest that I'm doing a lot of the other work. There's added other editors working on this, these as well. Each one of those things that I mentioned has a different editor um, and they all have a whole team of readers. Um, but so I guess for, for me, I just had to pick up all those skills of working with, uh, you know, managing that stuff and try to coordinate it all. And the fundraising stuff, learning how to do fundraising. I think that's probably quite valuable um, to, to know how to, <laughs> how to pitch a project and, and get money for that thing. Absolutely. And you also are an author as well, right? Yeah, mostly short fiction. Um, and of course, when you're, when you're um, a member of a writing group, um, your skills are always improving. And it doesn't matter what the level of the other people are around you. Um, when you're paying that focused attention to work, um, you're going to be developing those writing muscles, um, the things that you're picking up on, um, the sort of things that you're thinking about as you're critiquing a work. You're, you're going to be improving by doing that. Um, so that, that happens naturally. Um, and so for sure that's happened. I mean, it, it would be impossible to say how much, how much of the, my own improvement has been because of that and how much has been because of, you know, um, wringing my lack of hair, I guess, um, in front of a manuscript. Um, you know, we improve as we focus on things and some part of it is being in part, being in the writing group, but for, for sure my own writing has improved. Um, I, I guess, uh, but yeah, that, I, I suppose that's to be expected. Yeah, absolutely. While you're in that environment and just being exposed mm -hmm. to all those different stories and authors and 
skill sets. Um, thank you that you have a great perspective. Um, Ian, did you want to finish us off? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, on a personal level, uh, like I've obviously my skills as a writer, as a, as a um, what's called a dramaturg in in the theater world, which is sort of a script analysis person, um, have those skills have certainly improved as well as my cold reading skills have greatly improved. Uh, very, very grateful for that. Uh, but, but honestly, you know, a huge part of my job is, is connect is keeping in the community and finding cool people. And, uh, and the lab is a great spot to find cool people, be it be it aspiring playwrights with a lot of young playwrights with a lot of promise, be it people who are just interested in theater and might want to volunteer for our shows, actors, new people to the community that are looking for stuff to do. Like the, having a big network is a critical part of my job. And uh, the company of Theater by the Bay succeeds when we have lots and lots of great people working on the shows and helping to foster that community. Um, so, so in terms of that, I mean, like I, I would, it would be hard to say that Theater by the Bay is the company that it is today without the Barry Theater Lab as a pillar of of what we what we do and that ground level work that we that we um, are constantly engaging in. Um, on an on another sort of like also on a company level it uh one of the things that i get all of our playwrights who work in our seasons to do is to have their work while it's still in progress be read at the berry theater lab and part of and there's uh there's two reasons for that the on the on the one level um uh, I think it's important that we get sort of a built-in test audience of local people because we do local stories. So it may, you know, there, there may be perspectives on something, uh, uh, a topic perhaps that other people might have perspectives on that would be valuable for us to consider with the direction of the piece for whatever reason, be it positive, be it additional details we may not have uh, known to things like, hey, uh, I don't know if you should really go that hard on that topic or whatever, right? Just really, is, so it kind of is a built-in sort of test audience for that. But then on the other hand, it also provides us with um, free marketing. Because people who were at the lab that month, if there's 30 people that read it while it was a work in progress, they'll go, oh my God, that script was so cool. And if they tell three of their friends, that's 90 people and that's one house of the show filled. Um, so, it, so it works on multiple levels that way. Right. It's it's great to have your perspective because I find it fast because writing writing is very solitary, but the group you have is very because of the theater aspect, it's very different and there's sort of a much more or different elements to it. So it's been great having your perspective. Um, so I wanna wanna open it up to the floor now. If anybody has questions, you can either put them in the chat, and there are a few questions there already, or um, I'll change the view here so I can see anybody, or if you want to put up your hand. If you go down in the bottom of your screen under reactions, there's a little button there you can put to raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Or I mean, we're a fairly small group and you can just, you know, unmute your mic and have your question if you want. Marilyn, I have a question for you. Where do you meet? Where does your group meet in the normal times? Uh, well, we were meeting at uh, Grace United Church. Um, before that, we were meeting at the, um, oh, uh, the funeral home downtown, <laughs> which was oh, an yeah. interesting oh, yeah, yeah. experience. Yeah. Um, so we've been kind of going like we were looking a long time because we don't have any funding outside of our membership fees. We were looking for places that were, you know, cheap or free if we could find them, but you just can't find them anymore. It's really difficult. So um, we're finding right now that the online is really working out for us, but but we do have the option open to go back to Grace United Church once they're open to meetings again. Yeah, fair enough. Cool. There's something I wanted to mention that um, Ian made me think of, um, because we've been talking so much about community, but you mentioned networking specifically, and um, how that, I guess, is tied in with these writing, writing groups. And I, I guess related to that is um, promotion 
um, when you have a work you want to promote to people, which are two words that people are often scared by. Um, say networking, that sounds like one of those icky corporate things that I don't want to do. Or like promotion, I don't want to sell, you know, I know I'm not a salesman, but um, really networking just means talking with interesting people who share, you know, common interests with you. That's all networking means. <laughs> and it shouldn't be scary at all. And the same thing with promotion. Promotion is just talking with talking about stuff that you find interesting. You're passionate about this thing. So talk about it. And um, writing groups really um, provide you avenues to do that, to do networking and to do promotion in ways that don't feel icky. Absolutely. And in fact, I'd build on that. So one of the things that we do uh, after tip in again, in the normal times, after we take our break, we do what's called the shameless plug where we can go around the table and if people have something that they want to share it doesn't have to be theater related typically it is but it doesn't have to be uh they can give that you know that gives them that chance to kind of get that out into the group as well and that elicits all sorts of conversations after the lab is done which is pretty cool I absolutely love the shameless, the, the, you actually set aside time for the shameless plug because then it's just so, it just takes the pressure off, right? It's just so natural, everybody's doing it and that is wonderful. Um, any and then some, what you'll find as well is that uh, groups will send people <laughs> to go and, to be that person to do the shameless plug just again, so that way they're, they're aware of it, which is fun. Yeah, and such a targeted audience, right? It's the perfect opportunity. Um, so oh, we do have a question in the chat. Um, I wanted to ask about how you have dealt with sharing your work and your ideas with other writers. Do you ever wonder or hear about your ideas, plots being taken over by others? If so or not, how have you handled this? Does anybody ever want to respond to that? Uh, I think I haven't heard about uh, ideas being taken over, although at one time, a long time ago, I was accused of stealing someone's idea mine was totally different and when it comes right down to it you can't steal an idea everybody has a different idea when i was taking a writing course at georgian college basically what our teacher told us at the time was i could give an idea out to the room right now and i would get 16 different stories coming back to me next week so it's it's kind of a, a bit of a catch-22 in that respect that ideas can't be stolen they're just kind of out there in the universe it's when you see your own work word for word that's when you think oh you know someone's someone's plagiarized yeah i yeah. agree with that sorry sorry go ahead katie uh, I just wanted to add on my question there. Um, yeah, I I understand that. Um, yeah, that ideas are out there. I guess I just meant for it a little bit more personal. I personally have felt and um, that people had actually tried. Like, I'll share this incident because I think maybe as other writers you might laugh, maybe not. But um, I had. Um, self-published my book my book and um yeah so i was online and i had a group and it was you know gathering some followers and this one lady had uh followed my group and she was a writer too and i was like awesome you know let's support each other that was cool and um anyway then she messaged me privately asking for my phone number she wanted to talk to me about you know just saying hi so on and so forth about my book and yeah, so as she called me up, we scheduled a time and then she literally started basically asking me, though I had never known her or met her before, um, she wanted to know exactly what the purpose in my book was, what basically the key points in my book, um, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, while she she admitted on the phone that she was writing her book which just happened to be exactly the same genre and topic that my book was about so basically it was like you know so she didn't want to she didn't offer to buy the book though i was selling it you know none of that she just wanted me to kind of give her 
all the juicy bits of my story or my my book so that she could then it was just such a weird experience but um <laughs> i thought that was funny so no i just said well all my details are in my book and you're welcome to purchase a copy and i hope that you enjoy it and that's kind of how i answered that question um rather than you know getting into um how is my book different than all of the other books well then you need to read it to find out um so you know i think as writers that's kind of you know part of it <laughs> like you don't sit there and give you know the the plot like the the twists in the characters like it's like well read it you know and and then you'll you'll find those things but i don't know i guess panelists you might have a different point of view and i'm kind of curious because i just well, felt is. a little violated by that so i'd i'd love to kind of i guess with this question my goal is just to hear maybe some tips or techniques or you know on dealing with those types of situations because you're right david when you said it takes like you can't do this process alone you have to share ian too you know um yeah marilyn as well like all of you like we need to share these things so uh yeah i think that the best to do in that situation is not to to give too much information i mean if they seem to be that interested i'd be saying okay you know the book is for sale you can buy it and read it but here's a story i heard at one of our toronto romance writers meetings one author she said she had self-published her book and uh, you know was selling well and all that and she was going through um i forget whether it was amazon or where she was going through she saw a book that looked very similar so she went into the you know look inside feature and it was her book word for word someone had taken it changed the name changed the cover slightly and basically had totally plagiarized her work yeah and that's i so guess I the vulnerability when you're starting off it's just mm -hmm. so especially when you don't have um I don't know a name for lack of better word, but I just mean a like a when you're just new and fresh, those types of things are a little um, you know you can be more vulnerable to that. So because oh, yeah. sometimes people in the field they need ideas. It's like okay, they might have written so many books, and it's like okay, I need I need new ideas, I need new creative concepts. So you go to you know other people who are maybe you know whatever and so used to say that what she came up with in the end was wasn't totally different from what yours you know because no two people think exactly alike you might have given her some direction but mm -hmm. maybe as, as long as you didn't give her specific ideas like oh this is what my hero did this is what my heroine did mm -hmm. this is what happened to them you know that kind of thing then um, then you're kind of leaving yourself open yeah yeah i'd agree there was so. there any resolution to that are you asking me oh what no to marilyn was there any resolution? Oh. like did she go after them did she yeah well, what happened with online work it is i think you're trying to tighten down on it but it tends to be a little bit more vulnerable to that kind of thing. Now, um, we're kind of going back to old school. What they tell us to do is when we write our story, uh, either email it to ourselves or print out a physical copy and, mm -hmm. and mail it to ourselves. That's mm -hmm. really old school. But that, the, that way you've got that copyright date on and if something shows and like, don't open it, just leave it alone. And if something shows up in the, in the meantime that they're saying, oh, this is my story, you stole it from me. Well, no, I wrote this thing in 2015. Yours is 2019, like who's yeah. right? But what you know, was, <laughs> but did she go after, like I, I know that the procedure, but did, was there anything done about it? That's what I want to know. I don't think so. I think what happened was she went back to the company that published the book and they ended up, I think, pulling the plagiarized version. Okay, but so outside of that, I mean, it was still, you know, kind of out there. Right. 
So well, I, I know, and to, to your point earlier, um, uh, I spent many years uh, in advertising and I thought I had a great idea and then I'm watching TV and there's my commercial, right? I hadn't written it yet, but it's in my head, but somebody else has gotten <laughs> to it. So I, I, I understand your thought process about all, all ideas are universal. They're out there, right? And then how we kind of uh, do that. So until you get the until you get everything down on the, the, the page, printed, it's just an idea. It's like a song title. You can't copyright a song title, right? Yeah, so. exactly, exactly. Yeah, like, oh. and uh, book titles aren't copyrighted either because I don't know how many times when I've gone to try and find uh, a unique title for one of my books and I come up with something and I'll say, go on Amazon and I'll look for it and there'll be about 10 other books with that same title and I'm going, oh my God, how do you come up with something original? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, as creators, and that's really what we all are, it's just, you know, they're all babies, right? And we kind of do have that, you know, feeling like we want to nurture and protect it. And it's, you know, it's our idea, it's our baby. But, you know, it's, um, yeah, I guess I didn't want to fall into that part. I just was trying to get some tips or tricks or techniques and just being maybe like how do you guys you just openly share like when you're sharing a story for instance like in one of your groups for a critique do you only share certain sections of it or do you say here's the whole thing like one of you I'm sorry I forget which one was saying that you share the whole book and um yeah so then like so then you just give that out before it's been published or after it's been published or I guess I'm just wondering about those types of things like how to protect myself as an artist and also share because I want to learn and grow too. Um, if we could yeah, maybe well. have uh, just one person answer that because we had to have to have to get on sorry open yeah. mic. oh no problem <laughs> at all so if, if somebody wants to jump in and, and answer that that would be great but we after that we will have to move on so. Well, I would suggest that you, yes, just, just share it. Um, the, the issue that was raised before about somebody copying your book once it's been put online is a separate copyright yeah. issue. And there's going to be other things that you have to deal with there. But for the purpose of going into a writing group, um, this could potentially be a mindset, uh, a mindset problem. And actually a lot of people worry about their, their, their work being taken. It's very common to worry about, but um, if it's any consolation, I've never seen it happen. Um, and we can talk about the value of an idea versus the value of the actual written product. Um, and just to give some sense of that, I don't know if you've read Stephen King's book on writing, but in that book, he talks about what he calls his um, dollar babies. These are ideas he's had, and he's like, okay, I have this idea, but I'm working on something else, so I don't want to work on this idea right now. He writes a paragraph, and he says, you can buy this idea for one dollar. So if Stephen King is selling his ideas for one dollar, um, it maybe gives some sense of actually what percentage of the work goes into making that idea into something that's actually stealable. Um, if somebody takes your ideas in that initial stage, um, they're going to end up having to do all the work anyway um, to write it. Um, if your work is already at a stage where it's ready to steal, um, they just did all your work for you of selling it um, because you're entitled to whatever they make um, you know, through, through theft, although I've never seen it happen. So I wouldn't worry about it. Um, it's mostly a mindset thing, and it is very, very common to, to worry about this initially because um, these things are personal. Um, they mean something to mm -hmm. us. They come out of our you know, soul, so to speak. Um, yes. So we feel very protective of them, but um, I've never seen something stolen in, the, in that way. Um, it's quite common for things to be stolen once they're published as eBooks, but that's a separate, separate matter outside of the, the writer group. On this? I, haven't, I haven't spoken so far uh, tonight, but um, I will say uh, I'm, I'm a published uh, author, but I'm talking about some time ago, um, years, uh, I lent a one act play to a friend to direct uh, for um, the Sears Festival. Uh, that person ended up um, writing new scenes uh, and then uh, publishing it, including my scenes. Uh, the first time I saw it, uh, it came to uh, a school that I was at and uh, I couldn't get over it I'm, because I'm able to recite the script. 
Um, when I decided to attempt to litigate, uh, a very good friend, gave uh, a lawyer, gave me the advice that the publisher has more power. The publisher will bring lawyers to bear on this. Um, you have to decide how much it's worth uh, to you. And I know personally, if it's worth something, obviously, uh, I'm sorry, I should say it, it is something personal, but simultaneously, if you try to put a value on it at that point, um, you would probably lose even if you won. Um, thank you, Brian, that for sharing. I appreciate that. And I, I'm starting to get an idea for maybe another topic for one of our panel discussions, actually, because I feel, <laughs> <laughs> I feel well, that would be I'm gangsters. Too. Are there gangsters involved? <laughs> <laughs> Can I make a quick quick suggestion here for anyone in the Toronto area? If something like this happens to you, there's a there's artist legal advice services that offers free legal advice to artists. Um, I think it's only an hour of free legal advice, but um, you go in there, you tell them the problem, and an experienced entertainment lawyer and a law student will sit down with you and hash out the problem with you for an hour. So, um, David, could you put the link in the chat just so I could yeah. copy that, please? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. I would second that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, David. There, nice. there are professional organizations I you should know about where these issues are concerned you, that you can check with. The Writers Union of Canada is one. Access Copyright is another. I get a check from them every October. They're wonderful. Anybody who sends me checks is great. Um, or and they'll even tell you about things that aren't stealing. I had typed in something about a metaphor being stolen in a, a Writers Union of Canada workshop. We did it all in a more primitive online fashion a number of years ago, and it, it was subliminal, but it dissolved the group instantly because all these people had published various numbers of books. So it, it, it is a problem, but I, I agree with David that you know, when you're workshopping and all that kind of stuff, it's probably not going to happen. I think, Katie, your situation was an unusual thing. Um, I've been pirated in nonfiction in Europe, and you do nothing about that in other languages. Like, um, we can't afford to sue for that kind of thing. So no. what, what you, you just eat it and hope somebody says, oh, that Greek book about this, and I'll bet you that's good in English because that's what I speak, and they'll get a hold of it. Like, I mean, you know, we're never going to correct this. And of course, I keep thinking of poor George Harrison and my sweet Lord. So there you go. Um, he didn't mean to take that. And I really believe the stolen metaphor was subliminal. Um, you know, he did. He didn't know, but I felt bad for both parties. We just packed it in. So it's a pretty hurtful thing. But I, um, please okay. remember organizations um, like, like those ones I mentioned, the Writers Union of Canada, that's for book publishers. Um, I The League of Canadian Poets, I know there it didn't sound like a lot of poetry going on here, but still, that yeah. is an organization. Um, and certainly access copyright, like, will tell you what to do, even though their their mission is to get York University for paying for copying all our work. You know? and well, thank, more, you, thank, thank you, thank you very for, that's very helpful for, to, thank yeah. you to everybody for all those resources. Those, I didn't know about many of those. So I really appreciate it and sorry to have to uh, change topics here, but we do wanna get to the open mic with the few minutes we have left. So. I want to say thank you to our panelists. That was absolutely fantastic. You had great perspectives and mm -hmm. wonderful experiences that you shared, and I really appreciate that. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lind back to Linda, and she's going to uh, do the open mic. Yes, I am. Um, is there anyone here who uh, has something to uh, read for us? Um, you can either put your hand up in the uh, in the system or just uh, start talking. Unmute yourself and start. And if uh, you're you're unmuted now and you're not reading, please mute yourself. Sometimes we get a little feedback and stuff. OK. 
cats meowing in the background, that kind of thing. Okay, everyone is muted. Is anyone <laughs> going to read anything to us? Can be anything, can be poetry, can be a short story. You've got about five minutes that you can fill. Nobody. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't come prepared for it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess um, we'll just have to go back to start to talking about copyright infringement. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is probably a good a good uh, topic for another panel because it sounds like we could really absolutely um, discuss a lot of things, share some new links, and um, and help some people, and and, and maybe uh, alleviate some fears other people have who are worried about joining groups. I I've think... never had a I've never had an issue with with uh, anyone stealing my work. I don't know anyone whose work's been stolen, so. Well, you um, do now. To, when you join a group, there has to be a sense of trust and respect for each other. If you do find someone that you cannot trust, that person should not be in your group because if they're taking someone else's work and, and copying it, then they're obviously not showing respect to the original author. No, they're thieves. <laughs> I guess just it just it's so uncomfortable because it just gave me a I mean I do other things too as a photographer um, some of my classmates interestingly had ph photographic work stolen and Brian when you were saying in a different um, uh, country uh, um, so yeah, at this point, it was in Spain. They actually had taken from her website the images um, and like stole them and posted them in posters uh, in Spain. So she, we kind of laughed at it because she was a student. We were, we were students together. Um, but I mean, when you're an artist, it's just kind of unfortunate because it creates this level of mistrust and I mean, personally, I don't want to be that kind of person. I really want to believe that people are better. And um, yeah, so I guess, yeah, ultimately that's what I, I came here today. And also just um, if I can put in a quick another question, I'm just doing my first short story and um, it's new. It's, and I'm just like, kind of puzzling it away right now and I'm just wondering if there's any short story tips for anybody on here who's written any short stories. That's a big topic but um, one yeah. fun thing that I like to do for short stories is to see how much of the structure I can omit which is to say I like to write only the second act basically. Um, I want to start at the inciting incident and have the, all everything else implied, and I want to end at the at the climax, and have the uh, third act implied. Um, um, I I really started to like doing that after I read a lot of Catherine Mansfield's short stories, and she's really really good at doing that. Um, and I just, it, I mean, people talk about show don't tell, but. Um, how about show don't tell for the entire first act and the third act? I found that very impressive. Um, and I liked the way that when she wrote, the story unfolded in your mind um, past the ending and through the whole third act. You know how this thing's going to go or roughly how it's going to go. And it's stronger because it exists in your imagination. Um, it's mm. not confined to the page. Um, and that's achieved by leaving it off the page and, and just leaving enough there that, that it can exist in the, in the reader's imagination. Sorry, was, what was I your just add to that? Um, Catherine Mansfield. Uh, the Nick Adams short stories, uh, Hemingway's, and that's precisely what he does, which I can never do. <laughs> I salute you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've done it now and then, but I wouldn't, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm, you know, you know, it's something I aim for. It's something that I try to do. Um, but um, if you want to see how to do it, I mean, you mentioned Hemingway, Brian, but yeah, C Catherine, Catherine Mansfield, I thought was um, really stood out to me as someone who's really good at doing this. Great. I'm going to look her up. That's good. Thank you yeah. for that. Me too. Excellent. 
Well, and, and Katie, if you're interested in, uh, uh, George Saunders has just come out with a book and I think it's called A Swim in the Pond or something. And it's essentially his, um, his short stories course that he teaches at Syracuse University, I think. Um, he's basically mm. put the whole course into a book and it's uh, fast and it's on Russian short story writers. So it's, oh, that is so cool. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I've, just, I've just started reading it and, and, it's, and it's like a course. He goes through each, mm -hmm. each scene and talks about what's happening and then you read the next part and like a page at a time and then it gets more at a time. Mm -hmm. But anyways, it's, it's quite a fascinating book to read. Can you share cool. that in the chat too? Colleen? Yeah, I will share that in the chat. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, I'm actually starting school in September getting back to school for writing <laughs> so um and this just brings up a curious question on your guys's opinion on you know being a writer without formal education in writing like how do you feel about that <laughs> i don't know who here has actual um you know formal education in writing in particular but uh yeah how important do you think that is in becoming or is it just practice practice and groups and reading and i think a lot of it is learning as you go along like i haven't had any what you call formal education i took um one one or two courses up at georgian college just the part-time evening courses and mm. i have learned more from listening to other people's work um, finding out how styles have been changing over the over the decades um, that's taught me how to write because I know I had to write, I had the drive to write like other than the technical parts of it which you can learn without having to go to university or college um, you know what more do you need yeah, you just, uh, I've written all my life, and like I say, I was in advertising, and I actually taught writing for advertising at Georgian for a period of time, and when I got into playwriting and script writing, it was just write, just write and read, and I, I can tell probably everybody are big readers as well, right, and so just picking up books, learning about the structure, and and so I think what Marilyn said, it's the drive. You have the drive, you just do it. And um, you, you'll, you'll learn it by doing it. So I, I, does everybody agree or? Uh, I would say I, would say I agree. Um, I'm more practiced as a visual artist um, and I have very little formal training and it's all been developed through the doing. And the doing and the mm. doing and the doing Maybe the odd um, workshop, the odd how-to book, the odd YouTube videos mm -hmm. are, can be pretty fantastic. And I would say the writing for me is the same. Um, I don't think I'm anywhere near a master at this point, <laughs> um, but I'm getting, I'm getting to good. And I think because I'm in a writing group, a critiquing group, a small, uh, a small group of six other people who um, we meet weekly, um, and I think because of them and their very um, varied skill levels, I've been able to do very well because of them. Um, and books and workshops. And I'm not sure that, I mean, if you were to go look at all the top authors that you, you love, I'm not sure all of them are formally trained. Yeah. Probably under 50% of them, I would think, are formally trained. So. And I think I, I agree with you. I think every every writer is different. Some are formally trained. Some have MSA, MFAs. Some just learned on their own. Mm -hmm. But I think that if you are going to take the learn on your own route, you actually have to be fairly dedicated to learning your craft. You can't just mm -hmm. write. You have to consciously seek out mm -hmm. input or learn about craft. You can't just sort of write. But you know, I think some people like the formalized education because it does force them to do that. Um, and then, of course, they can put the letters after their name and whatnot. But uh, of course, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to say no. is, uh, I don't think anybody can force you to be a creative writer. No, no. Right. I mean, they, they can force you to write badly, but they can't force you <laughs> to be. Uh, you know, yeah, that, uh, I, 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 agree I have that. a PhD in literature, so, <laughs> but it, that has nothing to do with writing. 
Um, no. I just yet. read a lot. But that, in that case, I was being taught to be a critic, um, someone who would um, disassemble a piece of writing. And uh, I'm, I'm not saying that didn't help me. That really helped me. Simultaneously, it didn't make me want to be a writer or it didn't impel me to be a writer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like just for, for me, writing a 30 second commercial is a heck of a lot different than writing a feature film. <laughs> um, uh, mm -hmm. Even though there's a beginning, middle and end to, to both of them and learning. So even though the writing came, I'm not gonna say naturally, but just it was easier, uh, um, the structure learning the structure and that's what i think you probably learn more at school is you know yeah. what what the rules are and how to break them you know and mm -hmm. um so i think that's it's a what good i'm thing. hoping to gain actually yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah or i've got a stack of books now you know over the last couple mm -hmm. of years and I, I will say the theater lab got me interested in writing uh for theater and and screenplays so i went yeah. as just an interest as ian said and I stuck around and I started reading all these plays and I thought, oh, wow, I, this is cool and got me interested. And um, as one writer, screenplay writer, friend of mine that I, I, I have said, just finishing, a lot of people say they're going to write a book or a screenplay or whatever it is, and they just say it. But doing it and getting it finished, he goes, that's an accomplishment. You should just be proud of yourself. For, so I've written one play and I've written one screenplay so far. I'm not published anywhere uh, with these things, but I certainly feel, and that's what the writer's group did for me, you know, um, is I did it. I, I, I just did it. Is it great? No, but I got the feedback and I'm working on it, right? So... That's actually a good a good way to um, close off the night, really, because that's what the groups do. Uh, we meet regularly. We have to submit. We, you know, we're um, responsible to the other people in our in our groups to kind of work together, help them. Our, our editing and critiquing of their work helps us also learn to be better writers, and and it keeps us writing. It, you know, keeps us motivated. So that's that's one of the best things. I mean, pandemic. I wrote a I wrote a first, maybe draft 2.5 <laughs> of a book. And it was because, you know, I had the time and I had the group. If I didn't have the group, I probably wouldn't have finished the, you know, to the level I'm at. So, so much to be grateful for. Yeah. So, well, thank, thank you for putting this on tonight. It was uh, fun. Well, yeah, so thank you, we, everyone. Thanks. Great. So before we close this off, Colleen is going to tell us about what we've got to look forward to in February. And then we have uh, another um, event to announce when Colleen's done. Great, yes. Yeah. So our next event is on February 10th. Uh, it will be uh, online again because we are, the library is not meeting in person yet. And we are having three romance writers. We have Molly O'Keefe, Jenny Holiday, and Ferry, Farrah Heron all of who are award-winning romance writers and Molly O'Keefe I've had on panels before and she is hilarious. So if you're looking something a little lighter and sort of with the February Valentine's Day theme, you can come join us on February 10th. And these writers are always good. If you have a hard time writing romance scenes, you can pick their brain. <laughs> I know I'm not good at it. So the other very cool thing that we have coming up uh, is right after our... Um, our word, our regular word up, which is uh, usually the second Thursday of the month. So like Colleen said, it's the 10th. Uh, so Sunday, February 13th, uh, we're doing something called Becoming a Better Storyteller with the Barry Public Library. They've got an event called, uh, a week-long event uh, uh, for writers called Write On. So it will also be on Zoom. So actor, writer, director, acting coach, and storyteller Scott Hurst, who believes the words of Charles Lawton, who once said, to become a good storyteller, you simply tell stories you love to people you love. So he's come to help us get comfortable with the sound of our own voice, to speak quietly, loudly, pleasantly, irritatingly, quickly, slowly, and to express the intention behind our words, allowing our stories to come to life in the minds of our audience. 
He's got a, a 40 year career as an actor and singer. Um, um, we will very shortly be posting this on our website and our Facebook page. So, so look for that and, and uh, sign up information. Um, it's also, it's also then, on the Barry Public Library site as well. Yes, yes. So, so as soon as we have those links, we will share them. Um, and if you want to get, you know, the heads up prior to the event, usually about a week before is when we usually send them up. Um, WordUpBarry.com, sign up for our newsletter. Um, and we thank Rhubarb Media for hosting our website. And thanks to Czech Energy for Zoom hosting. Thanks to our amazing panelists for their insight and experience. And thank our word uppers. Thank you. You've become a word upper just for showing up. Thank you. <laughs>